Sorry about that. Just out of curiosity. Oh, we got a good crowd to start off. Uh, it's St. Patrick's Day, so I expect a few latecomers <laughs> that may be out of their normal mind. Let's just say. Uh, welcome to Down to a Science. This is a science cafe. It's a monthly science discussion night that is driven by your input and your questions. So we're, tonight we're going to be having a discussion on pesticides and how they impact amphibians and what that might mean to you and me. We'll see, we'll see if there's enough information for you to, for you to really care. Uh, but in honor of St. Patrick's Day, I'm going to start with a St. Patrick's Day science quiz for all of you. And, and uh, it's not going to be uh, a ju ju uh, just a quiz with no end. If you get the question right, you get a free beer. Just like St. Patrick would have wanted. <laughs> just like he would have wanted. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Down to Science before I start the quiz. Uh, it's a monthly science discussion. The mission is to support a civic dialogue from the point of view of scientific research. But fundamentally, I just believe in the power, the positive power and impact that scientific research can have in our society and in our world. Uh, there are people that are dedicated their whole lives to study the easiest little bit of thing. Tonight you're going to hear a man that's dedicated his life to studying frogs. Yes. And he doesn't study frogs because he loves frogs, though I think he does love frogs. <laughs> <laughs> he studies them because he believes that it's an inroad to actually making a difference in your life. And there are thousands if not millions of people across the world that do the same. And I'll, all I'm doing is setting up the environment to you have access to that. What you do next is up to you. So this tonight is driven mainly by your curiosity. Your interest in the subject matter, your interest in how this may impact your life, your loved ones, and your future. So I encourage you to ask questions, uh, make comments, all from that perspective of why should I care? And just and be curious about it. This is a, you're not at work, you took some time out, so have fun tonight. Uh, what I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about one more thing that we're doing, what I'm up to, and that's I started uh, t-shirts on my blog. I'm selling science related t-shirts to start the subversive message of science is good <laughs> in, in our land. I'm wearing one of them now, I'll model for you. Wearing science is a new black tonight. Uh, but we also have a number of different t-shirts, a phrenology head one, Adam and E, the real origin of the human species. Uh, I am adding more all the time. Science is what's for dinner on your apron. Uh, so if you're interested, go to my website, sciencecafesf.com, to find out more information. Uh, without further ado, though, it's time for the beer quiz. Who's ready for the St. Patrick's Day Science Beer Quiz? Yeah. OK, here we go. I got it. I got it. OK. Control. So question number one. Before you holler out answers, here's how it's going to work. I'm going to call on somebody. It's multiple choice. I'm going to call on somebody. You're going to give the answer. I'm going to run over to you. Stick the mic in your face. Give an answer. We're going to see if you're right. If you're not right, I'm going to move on to the next person. So we don't raise hands? You're going to raise your hand. Oh, OK. Did I not say that? Yeah, No, you didn't. OK, you're going to raise your hand. <laughs> Clarify. All right, question number one. How many calories are in a pint of Guinness? We're going to go back here in the white. How are you going to go with? This is in an English pint, not an imperial pint, by the way. 140 is incorrect. <laughs> We're going to keep going up front here with Deb. A196. 196. Let's see if she's correct, folks. She is correct. Yes. By the way, the latte, that was shocking to me. That's my drink of choice. That is not good. And if you believe this, that is not a good sign. That is not a good sign for tonight. You win a free beer, Dad. Let's see if I can find your beer, free beer. All right, question number two. The video game, since we're talking about frogs, 
The video game Frogger debuted in what year? Is it A, 1975, B, 1977, 1981, or 1985? We're going to go back here in the green. It has everything to do with frogs. That's what we're talking about. Is it free game? No, that was a great year, but that is incorrect. Next guess. We're going here. What was the guess? I'm going to go with C. 1981 is correct. 1975 is when Pong was released. 1977, like I said, was a great year. <laughs> and 1981 is when Frogger was released. Free beer. Get a good beer. All right. Question number three, and we'll see how much people are paying attention. Which one of the following is atrazine? And Professor Hayes, no, I will not take your answer. Is it A, that thing? B, that thing? C, that thing? D, that thing? And by the way, you're all familiar with all four of these things. Or at least you will be by the end of the night. I'm going to slowly walk to the back. I'm going to walk to the person I think who has the right answer. And she's going to say... B, for dramatic effect. B, correct. A is what you're all drinking tonight. C is dynamite. D is what the rest of you are drinking tonight. And B is atrazine, the, con the pesticide we're going to be discussing for the rest of the night. Last question, last chance for a free beer. Question four, the approximate amount of atrazine used annually in the U.S. is... A, is it not? Is it banned in the U.S.? B, 8 million pounds. C, 80 million pounds. Or D, 8 billion pounds. Oh, ooh, a hush falls in the crowd. <laughs> uh, C, 80 million pounds. 80 million pounds. Let's find out, folks. Oh, it's not banned. It's not the way of 10,000 gorillas. <laughs> and unfortunately, 8 billion pounds is the amount of is the approximate weight of the trash in the Pacific. 80 million pounds is correct. Congratulations. Uh, I hope you had fun playing the beer quiz. And uh, if you like the beer quiz, um, but unfortunately we're unable to win tonight, there is lots of beer available at the front. That is, they do uh, require payment, but it, should, it, is, it is well worth the experience. Uh, so in honor of St. Patrick's, go ahead and grab beer. We're just going to uh, be about a minute before we set up uh, the actual presentation for tonight on, uh, on pesticides and amphibians. While it's getting set up, I'm going to invite our speaker up, who is Dr. Tyrone Hayes. He's a professor of biology at UC Berkeley, my alma mater. And uh, I want to welcome him to the stage right now. So if you should hit function well, F7. Well, he's working on tech stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, function of seven? Is that right? I just did oh. function of seven directly. Let me, let me check this out. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you want to transfer the USB thing? Oh, that's right. Done the slide. I think we're all set. We're the full set. There you go. And uh, you want to hit the music button. The what? Yeah, first we just play. That's oh. Right. Hello? Well, I'm okay. Let me just make sure. Can everyone hear? Yes. Can you okay. hear me? No? It's my own. It is on. Oh, maybe the volume's down there. Yeah. I'll turn it on. It's pretty loud. Actually, Bill's coming up front. Turn up the volume. Are you finished? Hi. Go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? 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 Is that good? It's good volume. So, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank you for the invitation. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and get, and get started. I'm going to, as always, before I tell you what I'm going to do in terms of my talk, I always give appropriate acknowledgments before I speak, because without the acknowledgments that I'm about to give, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about will not be possible. My first acknowledgement is, as always, to my wife and my son and my daughter for their love and support. Uh, 
Uh, my second acknowledgement is always to the funding sources. It takes quite a bit of money to do the kind of work that I do. And this is also a matter of disclosure because the chemical that you've been hearing about already, atrazine, is produced by Novartis Syngenta. Uh, that's the company that produced it. And in fact, they were, I'm going in and out, they were the reason that I started working on atrazine. They originally funded me to do the work. I also want to acknowledge and thank all the students and my laboratory that have been involved in the work over the last 10 years. And finally, um, at least for the last couple of years, I always offer a special acknowledgement to my grandmother, who was like a third parent to me. She passed away two years ago, Christmas two years ago. And it was her goal in life to make the world a better place through education. And I'm doing my best to make sure that that dream could pass on with her. So, can I see? Am I fading in and out? Now you or is it just my ear? Okay. So, that being said, here's what I want to do tonight. Um, I've been asked to sort of make this conversation. I've been asked to. Now? Okay. I've been asked to sort of make this conversational. And so I do have a presentation that I normally give that talks about my work with Anthrazine and then puts that into a broader context to look at the impact of Anthrazine on the environment and then goes into some of the human public health consequences of Anthrazine. But what I'm going to do tonight to make it more conversational is I have several points where I can stop and we can have discussion if you like, or you can say, let's skip the rest of that stuff, let's go on to this topic. So I'm fairly flexible in, in how we approach the topic tonight. What I do want to do, first of all, you've already been briefly introduced to atrazine, but here's what it looks like. It's a so-called S-chlorotriazine. I, I usually say that's the family of chemicals it belongs to, but somebody told me they found it very offensive to refer to it as a family, so it's a group that it belongs to. It's an herbicide used with monocot crops, in the mainland here, I just got back from Hawaii, so I keep saying the mainland. Here in the US, it's mostly used on corn. And I also want to use this slide to point out that when I use the word pesticide in my talk, I mean anything that kills a pest. So not just insecticides. So an herbicide or weed killer is just one type of pesticide, as are argenticides, fungicides, insecticides, etc. It's been used for 48 years, actually 49 now. And, as you just heard, we use 80, 80 million pounds annually in the United States. And the reason that this is significant, the 80 million pounds, is because it, until recently, was the number one selling pesticide in the world. Now it's number two, more or less tied with Roundup or glyphosate. It's used in more than 80 countries, but it's now outlawed in all of Europe. Or as the company likes for me to say, it has been denied regulatory approval. Whatever the difference is, that keeps me out of court. And the main point is that here's a chemical where the country is actually, the home of the company is actually in Europe. So here's a chemical that we're using 80 million pounds of annually that's completely outlawed or denied regulatory approval in the home country. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to talk to you about some of the work we've done with anthrazine on amphibians. And I'm going to start first of all by telling you about our laboratory model which is the African clawed frog. And we were originally contracted by the company to assess how this chemical anthrazine might affect amphibian development. We apply the anthrazine to developing larvae just by dissolving it in the water. And what we observed was when these animals metamorphosed and we dissected them, so here's the kidney, we found that these animals had multiple gonads. So for example, this animal has two testes followed by ovaries, followed by large testes, followed by more ovaries, which is, as I always point out, not <laughs> For the last several years, I'd give this talk, and somebody would always ask me, why isn't that normal in amphibians? And I finally found out why. I finally asked, why does anybody think that? It turns out that in Jurassic Park, in the book and in the movie, frog DNA supposedly made the dinosaurs change sex. And, and that image, that piece of misinformation has been implanted in lots of people's heads. That's science fiction. We're only going to talk science today. There are some fish that are hermaphrodite, but there are no frogs that are naturally hermaphroditic. Here's the, the mechanism, and I'll show you the data, the mechanism behind the hermaphroditism. So, very simple. Imagine that this big circle is your testis, or if you don't want to subject your testicle to the kinds of things we're going to talk about, imagine a friend's testis. <laughs> Pick somebody that you don't care for very much, because it's pretty nasty. 
<laughs> if you have a testis, if you're a male, you should make testosterone, which is the male hormone. It, the word literally means hormone of the testis. That's where the word comes from. What atrazine does is, and again, I'll show you the data, is it turns on the enzyme. It turns on the machinery that converts testosterone into estrogen. Again, a word which literally means generator of estrus. It is, quote, the female hormone. The consequences in frogs are that you are chemically castrated or demasculinized because you're using up your testosterone to make the female hormone. And again, the consequences in a frog are that you actually start to grow ovaries, and as I'll show you later, you actually start to grow eggs in your testes if you're a male frog exposed to this compound. Just real briefly, here's what that looks like. If we look at blood levels of testosterone, so we can measure them in frogs just like they're measured in humans. Here's what control of unexposed males levels are. Here are the levels of atrazine treated males, and here are the levels of controls. So atrazine causes testosterone levels to dip down below what we see in females. So they are demasculinized, and that's coupled with the feminization. So for example, and remember this word, aromatase. This is, again, the machinery for converting testosterone into estrogen. It is normally, the gene is normally on in a female, in females, but not in males, because females should make estrogen. In the males that don't transform, they don't express aromatase. There's what female levels look like. But in malformed or hermaphroditic males, they express aromatase. The, Again, machinery for making estrogen as if they were females. So now we have a genetic or a molecular event that helps explain the morphological event. That work was all published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a few years ago. The stuff I'm about to tell you about now briefly has not been published. Okay? One of the questions that came up with our publication is, well, what happens to these hermaphrodites when they grow up? Because we were essentially looking at you know, the, new, the little baby frogs that were exposed. And the question that came up is, what happens when they grow up? Well, it turns out that a couple things happen to those genetic males. This is a male, and I like to imagine that he looks kind of happy. You, I'm not going to make this x-ray. You can guess what they're doing. But this one on the bottom is also a genetic male that was exposed to atrazine two years ago. He thinks he's a female. And not only does he think he's a female, if you look at these animals, and other people have shown the same thing, if you expose animals to atrazine, and here are the controls, the more atrazine you expose populations to, the fewer males you have in the population. So what we're seeing is not just a reduction of hermaphrodites, but as you increase the concentration of atrazine, you decrease the number of males in the population. So for example, by the time we get to 100 parts per billion atrazine, there's as few as 28% males left in the population. In other words, more than half the males have been completely converted into females. So they go from a hermaphroditic stage to this female stage. What this figure shows you is that they not only look like females and act like females, but these are eggs. So these genetic males grow up and actually lay eggs just as if they're a female. So they get completely converted, even though they're genetic males, into females. That's what happens to 10% of the animals at the lower concentration. The other 90% of the animals appear to be males, but if you look at their fertility, their, their fertility is reduced. So in other words, when you expose these animals in the first generation of atrazine, you get fewer and fewer and fewer males in the population, with most being converted completely into females. And of those males that remain, they have fertility that's down at about 20%. And what I'll do is I'll stop in just a minute, because what's interesting is, this is a quote from Syngenta, the manufacturer, and he's actually really quoting the EPA, who said, at this time, EPA believes that no additional testing is warranted to address the issue. So here we have a chemical, and, and we can talk about later its prevalence in the environment, that completely transforms male frogs. And the EPA has decided, and I'll tell you why later, that it's not worth addressing anymore. And I'll stop for questions in just a minute, but I wanted to move on. The next thing that we did, in addition to this laboratory model, is that we used another species of frog, a North American species, called the northern leopard frog. 
And, and we got equally traumatic effects to the ones that I just showed you in the African frogs. So this, these are the testes of a, of a male. But this, what I, what I used to refer to as the junk in the trunk, all this stuff are eggs that have grown in this male's testis. And what you're looking at, these protrusions, are eggs bursting through the surface of, of this male's testis. And this was work that we published in Nature. At this stage, I actually had a, I guess you'd call it a relationship with the EPA, where I was providing the data even before it was published, thinking that, you know, I don't know, an agency with the name Environmental Protection Agency would be concerned about the kinds of things that, that we were coming up with. And, you know, I love telling this story because their response was, well, that's interesting, but we're not sure if it's an adverse effect or not. And it's, it's, one those, it's one of those things that, I don't know, the thought of a dozen chicken eggs popping out of my testicle, not to make this personal, but it seemed like something you'd think an agency called the Environmental Protection Agency would be concerned about, but, but apparently not. So in keeping with my promise to make this conversational, before I move on to the next part of our study, other questions or comments or, or things that people wanted to, wanted to address? If you have a question or comment, I'll bring the mic around so everyone can hear you. And, and, and also, feel free to tell me, don't stop, we want to keep, you know. Yes? Was your uh, interactions with the EPA uh, bef also before the current administration, or is this mostly dealing with the EPA under the Bush administration? It's all been Bush. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it shocking? Yeah. <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is all just post-2000. Post okay. My understanding... Uh, in my understanding, crocodiles and certain turtles, uh, depending on how warm uh, the year it is, there's more females or males or males or females. Is that true of frogs? And um, is there a temperature uh, uh, relationship? Excellent question. Yeah, excellent question. So, in fact, it, it was the topic of my undergraduate senior thesis was in fact exactly the question you're asking. So, the comment is that in some turtles, some lizards, some crocodilians, uh, I think that's it, temperature can actually influence the sex of the animals. There's no documented evidence that that happens in frogs under a natural range of temperatures. Extreme temperatures may um, uh, disrupt normal sexual development, but it's not a part of their normal sexual development. But it may very well be possible that the effect of the pesticides will change with temperature for the following reason. At lower temperatures, you won't metabolize the pesticide as much, so the levels might seem higher in terms of the biological effectiveness. And in addition, at lower temperatures, you take longer to metamorphose. So as a larvae, you would be exposed for a longer period of time. And that's work that we're currently exploring my laboratory. So I don't have an answer for you. But, it, but again, the, the short answer is no. Amphibians don't normally fluctuate with temperature. But they may be a temperature interaction with the pesticide that we're studying right now. Yes? I think we'll have to yell. You might have to yell. Oh wow, okay, that's a good question. So, the next thing we wanted to do, to, wait, we gotta plan a few of these. So, precisely. So we had these laboratory studies that were controlled, but they're not real. And so the next question was, is this just a lab artifact, or can we go into the field, into the wild, and identify similar, similar problems? That, that worked out real nice. So your question is, are the effective doses ecologically relevant? Can you find them in the wild? And what I usually do before I move on is I give people a visual because I like to see things. And the visual I give people is the following. Because 0.1 parts per billion, you can't see. Right? So that's one-tenth of a microgram in a liter. So just to give you an idea of how much that is, that's what it takes to make a hermaphrodite. That is one one-thousandth of a grain of salt in four liters. So if you imagine a grain of salt, imagine dividing the weight of that grain of salt by a thousand. That's about what we're talking about. To continue with your question, do you find that amount, that amount of atrazine in the wild, in the real world? Well, the package of atrazine recommends application of 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. So atrazine is applied at levels that are 290 million times 
what we use in the laboratory. And if you look through the literature, you find minimum and maximum levels. So this is published literature, not mine. So this is a summary of dozens and dozens of papers. This is agricultural runoff. This is temporary pools, permanent water, and precipitation, so rain and snow. Here's what it takes to make hermaphrodite. And I usually point out on this slide, here's, what it, here's the levels or the range where you would find problems in the wild based on our laboratory studies. And, and I usually point out to people, as in this slide, whenever you see anything red in one of my slides, it means bad. <laughs> so if you see a red bar, a red line, a red spot, a red dot, you know that's, that's the bad thing. So the answer to your question is, there's enough anthrogen and rainwater in the Midwest to chemically castrate and make hermaphroditic frogs. In fact, rainwater can have more than 100 times what we use in the laboratory. And they've shown, the reason why the European Union banned it is that anthrogen can travel in the clouds over 1,000 kilometers or 600 miles. So they can measure it in France when they were using it in Germany. And it's been shown in the US that you can measure it in Minnesota from applications in Kansas. So it's traveling over 600 miles. The other interesting thing, and, and you can, you're now going to start to see why the EPA doesn't like me anymore, is here's what's allowed in your drinking water. Three parts per billion. 30 times what it takes to chemically castrate and make a maphrodite frog is what the EPA allows in drinking water. Because nobody ever tested three parts per billion. It's not, by the EPA's definition, toxic at this level. Okay? And I also have to point out that that doesn't mean that your water might have three parts per billion in it. That's the average over a year. So if you're living in the Midwest, one day you might have 100 parts per billion in your water. You might have 100 parts per billion for a month in your water. But the EPA says that over a year, if you average it out, it should be about three. But even if it were only three, we know already that that's 30 times what it takes to chemically castrate and make come African frogs. In fact, I usually tell this, this story of when we first started doing the experiments at the, at the university, the Environmental Health and Safety Office wrote to me and they had concerns. They said, well, what are you going to do with the wastewater after you treat these frogs, you know? And so I wrote back and I said, well, I'm going to take it home and drink it because it's got 30 times less than my, my tap water. <laughs> See, I thought it was funny too, but they, they don't take this, they take those things kind of seriously. But anyway, my point is that this stuff is not regulated nearly at, at, at levels that we would deem safe based on, on laboratory studies. So the next question is, do we see effects in the wild? Here are the kidneys of the leopard frog. And what I'm going to do now, this is a frog now from the wild, not in the laboratory, is I'm going to show you what's called a transverse serial cross-section. So to put it in other terms, imagine that I'm slicing a salami. If I fold out one slice, it would look like that. And the color is different because of the stain we use under the microscope. If I blow that up, and blow this section up. What you see are, here's for example one testicular tubule, kind of looks like slicing an orange. So they have testicular tubules just like we humans do. These are the nerve cells, but instead of sperm, there's eggs. Okay, you can see throughout this animal's testis. So instead of sperm, they grow eggs, just like we've seen in the laboratory. So if you look at a map of the US, showing highest areas of atrazine use, down to the, the lowest. Map onto that where leopard frogs live. Here's the first study that, that we published in Nature and in Environmental Health Perspectives. We found hermaphrodites in multiple sites, and everywhere we found hermaphrodites, there was atrazine. So we not only had this laboratory data showing that we can induce hermaphrodites, when we went into the wild, every time we found hermaphrodites, we found atrazine. What we're doing now is, this is a more up-to-date map on atrazine use. Again, highest areas in red, which, especially this time of year, I always point out, there's a whole new meaning to the term red states. You know? when, you, when you sort of look at it this way. What we've done now is we've done an extensive study over the last six years where we've looked at many, many, many more sites to try and look more carefully at this relationship between atrazine and the geographic distribution of hermaphrodites. But what's more is we've been able to do things like this, and I'll tell you the importance of it. We've been able to go to sites, for example, in one year, this site on the North Platte River in Wyoming, 92% of the males were hermaphrodites, such as this one with three testes, so he's got an extra one, but 
Even the extra one's no good because it's also full of eggs. And then we've been able to go to the same sites when the atrazine's actually flown down the river. It doesn't degrade, it just you know, flows to Mexico. And in those years where there's no atrazine on the same river, we get no hermaphrodites. And so the reason that that's, this is important is to follow. We can show that not only are there only hermaphrodites where there's atrazine, but there's only hermaphrodites when there's atrazine. And this is our further evidence that this is not a normal way for a frog to develop, because if it were, there'd be hermaphrodites every year, not just in the year that there was atrazine. Can we pause? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think actually, is this working? Yeah. Oh, it works when you lean that way. Surprising. Um, Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that we're looking at, if you remember that big map, one of the things that we're now exploring are other chemicals that might act either in a similar way or other chemicals that might act like estrogens themselves. But this is a particular site. One, they don't use that much anthracene here at this, at this site on the North Platte. And we think the reason that it was here in the first place was either because of a golf course or because it's used in forestry in Colorado. So this is a place where normally there would be no chemicals. We happen to hit them in the year when it was. And there hasn't been any atrazine since then. Um, we can talk more about the Midwest, but the other problem we have when we go north, like in South Dakota, where there's no agriculture, there's also lots of cows. And they actually use hormones in the cows, and that's been a concern of ours as well. Yes? How long do frogs live? Depends on the species and frogs in the wild. I, I can give you a guess. But um, in captivity, my daughters had a little frog for six years. I doubt they would ever live that long in the wild. In the wild, we're probably talking three, four, probably less than five years for your average leopard frog. Bullfrogs might live longer. Okay, so that means that the, the methodism is killing frogs. No, actually, good question. So when we do these studies in the wild, we're only looking at animals that metamorphose that year for a couple reasons. One is, if we collected the big adults, we would decimate the population. Okay, at, a, at an individual pond, in order to get the numbers, for me to give you accurate sex ratios, we have to collect 100 frogs. And for example, at this site, that would wipe out that population. But there are thousands of little ones, and so it has no impact. The other reason we only look at the little ones is we know that's what they were exposed to that year. If you're an adult, you could have been there three years, you could have been four, there four years. So when we get no atrazine, what that means is now the animals that were from eggs laid that year were not exposed. These animals may very well have grown up and become females or whatever, but we're not looking at the adults. Excellent question. Yes? So my question is a little related. Um, I'm trying to get a, well, are the offspring of the frogs that are affected by atrazine, do they come out normal or do they, um, they have the same issues with turning into hermaphrodites? For the while, we don't know. Um, the, only, the only way we would know that is in the laboratory studies that I told you about where we know who the mother was and we know that she was exposed. And the answer to your question is, remember I told you 10% become females, even though they're genetic males? If you breed her, an even greater proportion of her offspring become females. So we can actually, in one generation, select for sensitivity. So you get increase, and I showed you also the data with the dose, you get increasing numbers of sex reversed animals. But for the wild, there's, there's no way to know who was exposed and when when they're grown up. And in fact, if they completely become a female, there's no way to know that it used to be a hermaphrodite or whether or not it's a genetic male. And I, whoever asked about the other chemicals, I'm going to get to that in the next section. In the back. Uh, my question is, uh, is the process of bioaccumulation occur to moth or to make these frogs? Yes. And, and is that a phenomenon? Excellent question. In the case of the atrazine, the answer is no. Because bioaccumulation usually is when the chemical is actually held in the body, like the DDT. And so as you, as you go up trophic levels, you know, something eats, something eats. With anthracene, because it's water soluble, it goes through the body. And the only reason that frogs and fish are probably more effective is, even though they can clear it, like urinate it out, they live in the place of the urinate. So they're constantly exposed. And one might argue the same thing for a fetus, that's actually an aquatic organism. So there's, in the case of anthracene, no, there's no bioaccumulation. And, and, and it's almost, um, well, well, we'll actually get to what happens in humans. Is there anything, I, from what you just said about the age of the population you're sampling, but in the laboratory, of any reversion back to normalcy once you remove the atrazine? Uh, 
Does the production of eggs go down and the sperm go up or any of that stuff? Excellent question. So in the case of developmental exposure to anthracene, no. 10% become females, and as far as we know, they're permanently females. The 90% that are males, um, actually, no, I take that back. Of, the male, of those that act as males, if they're continuously exposed, their sperm count stays down and they can't fertilize. If you actually take away atrazine after they metamorphose, their fertility actually will go up. And if you expose them only as adults, and their testosterone level goes down, if you take away atrazine, it will return to normal. So it depends on when you're exposed. And the same thing's true of you know, humans that expose exposure to carcinogens or other compounds in utero exposure is much more permanent and detrimental damage than exposure as an adult. I have a quick comment, yes. and that's, uh, I'm gonna be your Syngento rep for tonight. Okay. So according to their uh, information, uh, the half-life of atrazine in terms of its natural degradation cycle is somewhere between 15 and 30 to upwards of 45 days. So why are we seeing this kind of effect uh, if the half-life is that short, which is pretty short for a, a pesticide of this nature. Actually, I've, I've even seen half-life reports of eight days, and that's under ideal conditions if you put atrazine in the water, under UV light, in the, on surface water. Uh, studies now show that atrazine in the groundwater in the aquifers in France, where it's been banned for 10 years, have not changed. So once it's away from UV light in the groundwater in the aquifers, you're looking at over 10 years, and in fact, if you measure atrazine in the Midwest, if you go there right after the snow melt, you can measure it above 0.1. So it never goes below 0.1 parts per billion. So once it's in a complex environment, you don't see that kind of ideal half-life. And you're right, that's been one of the things that was reported initially that atrazine is so safe because it breaks down so quickly. But in fact, in the real world, that's not the case. And, and that's actually, even some gentles reported that now. It's difficult to get those data done. Okay. Now, and we're going to get to these other chemicals that somebody asked about right now. So, somebody was asking about what about other chemicals. So, this is, by the way, what I call the lab field lab model um, in terms of the type of data that we generate to, to make our case for anthracene. So, again, we started with the lab studies, then we went to the field studies, and now I'm going to show you something that's sort of in between, what I call the field simulation that's kind of captures the control that we have in a laboratory study but gives us a more realistic view of, of what atrazine might be doing in the real world. So, and, and I forgot I had this in there. I call it my CSI approach. In part, because I travel a lot. So, so what I've learned is no matter where I go, no matter what time it is, no matter what channel, some version of CSI is always on. And it, it sort of, you know, I sort of got this idea one night as I was watching, you know, so we rope off our crime scene. And, and think about it. What you actually want to do in the real world at a pond, such as one that's right there in this town in Nebraska. If we're concerned about frogs in this runoff from this corn, even though we have this clear-cut data in the laboratory that show that atrazine causes the problems, when you go to the real world, just like on CSI, there's a whole lot of other suspects in the real world. And so just like the question that was asked there, how do we know that these other herbicides and these fungicides and these insecticides don't do the same thing or don't contribute to the problems that we see in the field, even though we get good clean data in the laboratory. The short answer is we test every, at a site like that one, we test all the chemicals that we know are applied one at a time. And I can tell you that of the chemicals that are applied to corn, no other chemical makes hermaphrodites other than atrazine. But the other question, a couple things I want you to get from this slide. This is what the animal facility looks like in our laboratory. So there are 30 tadpoles in each one of these tanks. And in this particular experiment, there is 30, 60, 90 tanks. What I want to point out is that everything's done blind in my lab to keep everybody honest. So right now, there's a student adding a red, white, red solution to a red, white, red tank. Nobody knows which pesticide is which or what the mixtures are except me. And then when each of these animals metamorphose, they're kept individually, in this case 3,000 individuals, and they get a number. So that when I'm asked to do an analysis, all I have is the number. So I have to get the color decoded by my staff, and then they have to get the color of the pesticide decoded by me. So everybody can do the analysis blindly without knowing which is which. What we did in this particular study is we looked more at the gonadal malformations. We looked at what other types of effects might occur in animals that were exposed to this mixture of pesticides. 
And this is work we just published last year. So for example, we compared, in this case, controls. In this case, atrazine and metolachlor, two herbicides, two weed killers, the two that are persistent. And then we compared that full nine mixture of compounds that I showed you. And what you're looking at is the time to metamorphosis. And this colored line shows the average time to metamorphosis relative to the unexposed controls. And we found, for example, that atrazine and metolachlor retarded development, or delayed metamorphosis a little bit, but the full mixture delayed metamorphosis by two weeks. So, and that's interesting because no individual compound retarded development, but when you mixed all nine together, you got a profound and significant effect. I'm still communicating with the EPA at this point. They won't talk to me anymore, but at this point I was still communicating with the EPA. And I said, okay, well when you mix atrazine with other things now, you get even bigger effects that are even more obviously detrimental. And they wrote back and they said, well, it's statistically significant, but what is the biological significance? And I want to show you what the significance of a two-week delay in metamorphosis is. Here's that ditch in Nebraska that I showed you earlier. It's about a foot and a half deep. And here's literally that ditch 24 hours later. Okay? So what you're faced with as a tadpole in this environment is a necessity to metamorphose quickly before the pond dries up and you desiccate. Okay? So that's... So that's one, that's the biological significance, is if your metamorphosis is delayed by two weeks, you're going to be in trouble in terms of survivorship in this environment. What's more is, what's worse, is that as the pond dries up, the pesticides become more concentrated because the water's leaking. In this case, over 200 fold. So not only do you have tadpoles that have to metamorphose quickly to escape the drying pond, but as, they, as the pond is drying, the very pesticides that retard the development are becoming higher in concentration, okay? So it's biologically significant. What's more is we looked at the following, and I'm gonna show you what this looks like and then we will discuss it. We compared the time, or sorry, the time of metamorphosis with the size of metamorphosis. Let me just pop this up and I'll show you what, it, I'll show you what, what the significance is. So if you just look at the controls, each one of these dots represents a tadpole, and there's about 180 dots in each of these figures. What this shows you is that the longer you take the metamorphosis as a tadpole, the longer your larval period, the bigger you are when you metamorphose. I'm going to give you an analogy to, to sort of illustrate the biological significance. It's like being pregnant. The longer you're pregnant, the bigger the baby, because it's a growth phase. If you're exposed to these two herbicides, you see the opposite trend, and if you're exposed to the full mixture, you see a statistically insignificant opposite trend. They take longer to metamorphose, and the longer they take, the smaller they are. Now, here's why that's significant. If you look at all these individual pesticides that we tested, again, none of them cause a delay in metamorphosis, none of them individually cause a septanthrazine, sexual abnormalities, but when you mix them together, you get this significant and negative effect. This is important because there's no way you can predict this effect by looking at, oops, there's no way you can predict this effect by looking at the individual compounds. That's significant because the Environmental Protection Agency regulates chemicals by looking at their safety one at a time. One, I'm already telling you, they're not, they're not looking at the right parameters. But even if they were, there's no way you can predict this kind of effect by looking at these individual compounds. The analogy I like to use is, that's like if you went to the doctor and he or she gave you a prescription and didn't ask what, else, what other medications you're taking. But in fact, what you might be exposed to through your drinking water is exactly that scenario. Even though any of these chemicals individually might not have an impact, when you mix them together, there's an impact. The biological significance of that for a frog is the smaller you are, the less likely you are to find food because they don't chew, and the smaller you are, the more likely you are to be food because you're more likely to get chewed, so to speak. This might, I might be a good place to ask if there are questions, actually. Oh, no questions? Here we go. Have you tested particular combinations of those chemicals to see if it's like a group of two or three of them? Absolutely. Power sets are big, but... Excellent question. So, so one of the things that we are doing now is trying to figure out if some of the chemicals in there are neutral, if some of them are the effectors, and some of the enhancers, 
Um, we haven't completed that yet in part because we haven't got the funding to do it. And, and you can imagine all the combinations you have to test. And so we don't even really have a good strategy yet for how you go through that combination. And as you'll see, the stuff we're doing now in California is even worse because it's a lot more than nine compounds. I, I have a quick comment, actually. Mm -hmm. For all you know, we don't live in the Midwest where all the red was on the map. So there's a there's kind of an aspect to this, like why should we care here in San Francisco? Our water is great. Uh, well, who, who's having a beer? Just raise our hands. Awesome. I, you had a beer tonight too, I, huh? Yes, I do. Well, uh, a good percentage of that is derived from corn, as is almost. 60 to 80 percent of our food. Uh, if you haven't read Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, he will tell you how much your percent percent corn, and we really are the corn people of the world. So if you think, oh well, our water's good, well maybe that's not the whole story. And in fact, I'll talk about California. So probably even more to be concerned about California, and we'll, and we'll get there. Here's the other thing we found out, which actually may start to become more relevant, is the other effect we saw is that if you look at unexposed animals, compared to the animals exposed to the nine compound mixture, 90%, or not, not 90, 70% of those exposed to the mixture developed flavor bacterial meningitis. So they developed meningitis just like we do. And what we found out was that the thymus, so here you can see a healthy thymus from, from this animal, and here you see a thymus with holes in it. This is the source of T cells or immune cells in these animals, the thymus is damaged in these animals that develop the disease. And it turns out that all these animals had the flavobacterium, but only the exposed, pesticide exposed animals get sick. So we had also, in addition to the effects on growth and development, we had this immunosuppressive effect occurring. What we decided to look for then, and, and, and this starts to become relevant to humans, is what role stress hormones might be playing in these effects. Because the stress hormone, the glucocorticoids, so they're called, are immunosuppressive, just like they are in humans. They decrease growth and they retard development. And it was the same suite of effects that we saw with the pesticide mixtures. So we proposed that the pesticides, when you mix them together, were perhaps in some, maybe even generic way, activating the stress axis, which in turn caused all these effects that we were seeing. We tested that just by looking at levels of stress hormones and showed that the pesticide exposed animals indeed had higher stress hormone levels, higher corticosterone levels, as we would have predicted. What's more is we went back and we started to look at animals collected from agricultural areas more carefully, not just at their gonads. And we found that animals often look like this from agricultural areas, so that should be a liver. And, and that, I love this slide, because that looks like a smiley face wearing sunglasses. So was, <laughs> but what it is, this is a slice under the microscope. Each one of these lumps is a slice through a cesto worm, a parasite. We looked at other animals, and these are the kidneys, these two things. Here's kidney tubules, but all the rest of this kidney is filled with trematode worms, another parasite that actually swims up the urinary tract and infects the kidney. So we propose the following, and, and we'll get to California to test this in just a minute. We propose that environmental stressors might affect the stress axis, and we've actually shown this in publication. So for example, if the temperature goes up, and the pond dries up, and the animals become really crowded, their stress hormone levels might go up. These could be natural events, or these could represent um, global climate change combined with draining wetlands for agricultural purposes. There's interactions between these environmental stressors. So the pond dries up, and I already showed you the pesticides become more concentrated. As you activate your stress hormones, you mobilize the fat-soluble pesticides, which add to the water-soluble pesticides, increasing your stress response. And here's what I believe is important about the model. As you increase the stress response, as we've shown in the laboratory, you damage your immune system, which leads to disease which can lead to individual death and population decline. And what's more in the field is because your immune system's lower, you end up with parasitic damage to your liver and your kidney. Here's what's significant about the model. If you were poisoned, what are the two most important organs in your body? Your liver to metabolize the poison and your kidney to secrete it. 
But here we have a model where pesticides lead to a stress response that damage the immune system, which leads to damage to the liver and kidney. So not only do you have a high pesticide load, but you can't get rid of the pesticides, which effectively increases your internal pesticide load. And of course, the more pesticides you have, the more cortisol or stress hormone you have, the more damage you have to the immune system, the more parasites you have. The more parasites you have, the more, you see, it's sort of a vicious cycle. The other thing that's significant about the model is, if I were just a wildlife ecologist, without the laboratory data that I've shown you, I wouldn't see the role that pesticides are playing in population and maybe even in global amphibian declines. Because I would go to a pond and I would see frogs that didn't metamorphose in time and dried up. I would see frogs that couldn't find food. I would see frogs that got eaten. I would see frogs that got diseases. I wouldn't see the intricate role that pesticides are playing in all those negative interactions. So the lab, the interaction between lab and fetal studies are very important. This is just to point out that other people have shown similar immunosuppressive effects of pesticides. So for example, the limb deformities which you may have heard about are caused by parasites probably, not by pesticides. But it's been shown that the host that carries the parasite, snails, other labs have shown that atrazine lowers immune function in snails. So they carry more parasites. And then a study in 2002 by Joe Kiesiger showed that atrazine lowers immune function in frogs so that they get more of the parasites that cause the limb deformities. So another study showed similar things. And in 2006, the study showed that atrazine increases ranavirus, a virus susceptibility in another species of amphibian. So we're not the only ones who are, who are making these, these suggestions. The next question is, and I'm going to stop here for questions, is all the arrows and stuff look nice. But how do we really prove in the real world, in this landscape, that there are really these interactions between environmental stressors and pesticides? And that's the next set of work that I'll tell you about. Yes. Okay. Well, before we take one, one question, we're going to take a set of questions and then take a break. Is that okay? Sounds good to me. All right. Or actually, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a why don't we take a set of questions and then let me do one more section because that's going to end all of my frog stuff. And that'll, oh, that'll be a more natural. We're not going to talk about frogs in the second half. No, I was going to talk about people in the second half. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Are there more insects in the area? Say again. Are there more insects? Like, are there are they are the frogs and other animals less affected by predators when they're stressed? Ah, so there's probably more broader ecological effects. So the question is about insects. So two things are happening that I'm not even measuring. One is the herbicides that run off into the water kill the plants, the algae, et cetera, that the tadpoles are supposed to eat. Okay, so in the real world, in the laboratory, we know it's just the pesticides. But in the real world, they're not only affected directly by the pesticides, but the food base for the tadpoles is going down because the herbicides kill the aquatic plants. In the real world as well, the insecticides are killing off the insects that the frogs are eating. So not only is there decreased growth because of the effect that I told you about, but ecologically, there's a decreased food base for both the tadpoles and the adults because the plants and the insects are being affected. And for some of those, somebody asked, for some of those pesticides, there may very well be bioaccumulation, just not for atrazine. Others of them probably are accumulated. Uh, are there are there any Comparisons to Roundup and, and with atrazine and Roundup because Roundup has such a, a good rep. Yeah, we haven't looked much at Roundup. Another guy named Rick Relia has looked at Roundup and shown direct mortality, but he looks at levels that are a thousand times higher. All these pesticides I'm talking about are still at 0 0.1 parts per billion. He's looking at a thousand times higher. We are just now starting to look at Roundup, and the supposedly with Roundup, it supposedly has a very short half life. And I think the data supports that, so it does go away very quickly. Um, but supposedly the chemicals that Roundup is mixed with, the so-called inert ingredients, are supposedly more harmful to frogs than the actual pesticide. And that's not my work, that's other work, public work that's been published by others. It's funny to show off for just a second. Um, just, you know, Abby, and another aspect of scientists, we learned that uh, stressors are one of the main contributors to aging. Mm -hmm. So, I wonder if there's any chance that these frogs are actually either look older at a person their age or they die earlier? In the real world, they, well, in the real world, I would guess they die earlier in part because of the 
decreased food base, both because of the direct effect of pesticides and also the decreased growth, the increased predation, although you might expect that their predators are often are also affected by some of the same negative aspects of, of pesticide exposure, um, but also because of the immune failure and the higher parasite loads, I would guess that they would fall off and die much earlier. But it, you know, it's a harder thing to measure in the field. Um, but I will, I'll show you some data in just a minute, which is why I don't want to stop for the rule break until we get through about six more minutes. Let's, let's take one more question before we start and end the break. No, no questions? Okay. All right. So no. here's what I want to do. I want to finish up the so-called lab field lab model and show you why I call it that. Because again, we started in the lab, we went to the field, we came back and did a field simulation. The other things that we do in my lab and these data are mostly unpublished right now and ongoing, is that we actually collect tens of thousands of gallons of water for multiple years at multiple sites and keep it frozen in the laboratory. So we can really thaw that water out and ask, for example, in 2001, we saw 92% hermaphrodites. We supposedly, or presumably, have that chemical contamination captured, frozen in time. And we can thaw that water out and ask, can we reproduce these abnormalities in the laboratory with that water. And then we have water from what I told you were clean years as well. So we have sort of a set of controls. And that's what I mean by lab, field, lab. We start in the lab, go to the field, and then we effectively bring the field back to the lab. The last little piece I want to tell you, I want to get to California, is that we sort of run the model backwards as well. Instead of bringing the field into the lab, sometimes we take the lab into the field. And here's what I mean by that. And, and this will get it closer to home. Here's our California stuff. This stuff is unpublished. It's the stuff that we're about to publish um, this coming June. We've been working in the Salinas, along the Salinas River, which flows this way, flows south and north. And California is very different. In the Midwest, 90% of the pesticide is atrazine and Roundup, or glyphosate. However, if you add up all the pesticide in Nebraska, Kansas, and Iowa, it doesn't equal the amount that we use in California. California is the single biggest user of pesticides for a couple reasons. One is all they grow is corn and soy in the Midwest. In California, we grow over 350 agricultural products are produced here. I don't know if you guys realize that. 50% of the U.S.'s agricultural products, 50% of the U.S.'s food comes out of California. Okay? And we grow year round. So there's a lot more pesticide usage. And in fact, the Salinas River Valley produces 85% of the country's lettuce. Just this little short stretch, 85%. 90% of the almonds, most of the artichokes, most of the strawberries. So there's a huge amount of agriculture going on in a short stretch. This provided us with sort of a unique opportunity because the beginning of the Salinas River right here starts out clean. There's no agriculture. And it starts out relatively stress-free. So the water's about 22 degrees uh, Celsius. It's about a foot and a half to two foot deep. Very little environmental stress. 30 miles down the road, the river dries out. In fact, the river's dry through this whole stretch. This water is about two inches deep, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so about 38, 40 degrees Celsius. And the tadpoles, as you can see here, in this case, there's about 3,000 tadpoles in that one little pool. So they're experiencing what I talked about earlier, high temperature, desiccation, um, and crowding. So they're stressed, but still no pesticides. And then, as you get down near Salinas, it looks non-stressful again, right? One and a half, two feet of water, 22 degrees, so a relatively cool temperature, except all of this water is agricultural runoff. 100% of the water is coming off of our food, basically. So just to give you an idea what that looks like on Google, here's what it looks like upstream, protected San Padres National Forest, no agriculture. 30 miles down the road, here you can see the Salinas River, it's all dry. I mean, maybe when it rains, there's water, but and apparently, because of agriculture, the water table is so low, apparently they pump water out of another river and pump it into the ground just so that they can have water for, you know, for, for usage for agriculture. Okay? So there's essentially no water here, and again, 100 degrees, 2 inches of water. And then further down, now you can see the difference. Okay? This is all agriculture, this patchwork. Here's the city of Salinas. So if we put it all in perspective, again, the water becomes more and more contaminated as you move down. 
and we can compare sites that are relatively stress-free, that have environmental stress but no pesticides, and that finally have no environmental stress but high pesticide and fertilizer loads. So we can really test that model with all those errors. So just real quick, if we compare the three sites, our model will predict retarded development. Okay. And that's what we see. If you're under environmental stress, high temperature, and just pond drying or crowding, or if you have none of those but just pesticides running off crops, your development is retarded, as is your growth. So just like our model would have predicted. Here's what I mean uh, by retarded growth and development. As they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. This animal's from a stress-free site. This animal is collected on the same day, exact same age, gestational age, same developmental stage, but it's in a little pool at 100 degrees, drying up of 3,000 animals in about a five foot radius. And this animal is in the same environment as this one, except that it's in all agricultural runoff. So there's a dramatic effect. Here's what I mean by bring the lamb into the field. Here are two of my students. We literally took out cages, so instead of doing a lab experiment, we took out cages, and then we just picked up at each site one tadpole 30 times and put each one in these individual cages. Then what we did was we wanted to test immune function, so we thought maybe we'd measure white blood cell count if we gave the animals an infection, see if they could fight it off. And so, you know, I always joke, we injected them with a dangerous pathogen, but what we did is we just injected them with bread yeast. You know, so we thought we were giving a benign infection that would, you know, help us allow just allow us to look at immune function. But what happens when you do that is the following. In Santa Margarita, 